So this is our third and final part of uh, our pre-labs for uh, thinking about molecular modeling. Uh, we talked a lot about molecular orbital theory, we've talked about hybridization, we've talked about charge, we've talked about reactivity. Uh, we spent a lot of time in part two actually going through the mechanics of how to use WebMO to get these uh, molecules optimized and get some good information. In part three, I want to explore a couple of things at a little bit deeper level. I want to talk about orbitals again. I want to talk about molecular geometries. I want to think about what we can learn about a, a few different molecules uh, from computational chemistry. Um, and I want to show you a case specifically where the cleanup tools don't work to get a good minimum uh, based on their, their cleanup. And I want to talk about how to handle that. And that's going to be particularly useful uh, for a couple of the molecules you're going to see this semester. Uh, the one in chapter five that's probably uh, the biggest issue would be aniline or the four amino pyridine. Uh, very well, could have the same problem that I'm going to show you for another molecule uh, in this segment. So I want to start off by thinking about uh, ammonia, which is the probably the most simple nitrogen compound we can look at. It's an NH3 molecule, uh, all single bonds from the nitrogen atom. VSCPR predicts that it will have a trigonal pyramidal uh, C3B geometry. And it does. So just like uh, with hydronium, the SEPR predicts it pretty well. Um, and we can optimize that structure. Um, I'm not going to go through the optimization uh, of each of these molecules, because I'm assuming at this point um, you've uh, worked through a number of examples and you feel reasonably comfortable with that. Um, if you want to optimize these on your own, I uh, certainly encourage you to do so. Trigonal pyramidal is a, a good structure for ammonia. One of the things you probably have learned about is something called ammonia inversion, where uh, ammonia molecules can actually invert and change whether the lone pair is on the, the top or the bottom of the structure. Uh, we can figure out how much energy is required to make that happen um, by trying to optimize the uh, trigonal planar uh, transition state, which is, is this molecule right here. Um, it's just like we did with hydronium, except this is a 5 kcal per mole barrier. Um, it's a fairly small barrier as, as reactions go. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of energy to, to get over it. Um, and it goes from sort of one extreme, where the lone pair is on the top of the molecule predominantly, to a trigonal planar transition state, where the lone pair is symmetrically above and below the molecule, to the other extreme, where the lone pair is primarily uh, at the bottom of the molecule. And so we can do some calculations and, and track the changes. We can see the relative energy change from 0 to 5.5 back to 0 kcals per mole. I want to highlight this case because it actually shows sort of the two extreme nitrogen lone pairs that we see in molecules. One is the pure p-type lone pair that uh, occurs in the trigonal planar state, uh, that transition state uh, during the ammonia inversion, where we have a completely symmetric uh, lobe above and below the plane containing that lone pair. To the sp3 type lone pair that we see present in both of the trigonal parental or C3B ammonia structures. This is well predicted uh, by VSCPR to be about an sp3, and that works out. A trigonal planar shape uh, should have an empty uh, p orbital, and it does. So, so both of these make some, some pretty good sense. Uh, what's interesting about this exact case uh, is that not only does it highlight the two possible lone pair types, sort of the two extreme ones we can see with nitrogen, uh, but this, this reaction um, has a pretty low energy barrier but actually also goes by quantum tunneling. And so even at very, very, very cold temperatures, um, where it doesn't have enough energy to go over the barrier, this is one of the known cases where it can actually uh, tunnel through the barrier. And so this is a reaction that really can't be stopped even at very cold temperatures. Uh, not the point of this lecture, but uh, kind of an interesting side note. So I'd like to look at a couple more nitrogen lone pairs and see where they compare to our, our two extremes, the p orbital lone pair we saw in the transition state of uh, ammonia and the sp3 lone pair we saw on the uh, stable uh, uh, ammonia minimum, the trigonal pyramidal shape. And so I'd like to 
send us to form amide. This is our smallest possible amide. We have our carbonyl functional group next to the NH2, and this is the optimized structure for form amide. You'll notice that it doesn't have the pyramidal shape that we saw in ammonia. Uh, this is a trigonal planar nitrogen. And so we'd expect that, that p orbital lone pair that we saw during the transition state uh, of ammonia, except this is the stable structure of form amide. We might have been able to predict that ahead of time based on some resonance structures that you've probably already drawn. Um, amide functional groups have a, a nitrogen atom lone pair that is in conjugation with the neighboring carbonyl group. And so we can draw a resonance structure that looks like this. This shows us some significant double bond character between the carbon and the nitrogen um, and in this sort of bitter ionic uh, resonance form. This sort of conjugation is uh, common, and you should be on the lookout for any time you have an atom with a lone pair adjacent to a pi system, you might expect some sort of conjugation. And that's indeed the case here. Um, using an NDO calculation on form amide, we can look at the lone pair on the, the nitrogen atom, and that is a p orbital lone pair. We see the symmetric lobe above and below the plane of the molecule. This works out great for form amide because with that p orbital lone pair, it can conjugate very effectively with the carbonyl group. Uh, as we look at the pi molecular orbital, we see that that lone pair is not isolated on the nitrogen, but delocalized and uh, overlapped with the carbonyl pi bond. So here we see sort of the sp2 hybridized nitrogen, uh, sort of the uh, other case, we saw the ammonia sp3 nitrogen. We see the sp2 case here because that p orbital lone pair is maximizing the ability of that uh, lone pair to conjugate with the pi system. And if that nitrogen has a p lone pair, it must be an sp2 hybridized nitrogen atom. The first case we looked at is the ammonia, which has that sp3 hybridized lone pair. I mentioned that VSCPR predicts really well uh, the structure for uh, the lone pair in ammonia. And that's because VSCPR is based on electron-electron repulsion. And a hybridization that puts that uh, lone pair in sp3 hybridized orbital will minimize that electron-electron repulsion. And so I, I want us to think about p orbital lone pairs on nitrogen helping maximize conjugation of pi systems and tetrahedral electron geometries with an sp3 lone pair, allowing for the NH bonds to get as far apart as possible. These are sort of two opposite effects. Um, and many nitrogen atoms have a hybridization that's actually somewhere between the sp2 of formamide and the sp3 of ammonia. And they exist as a compromise of these, these issues, the maximizing of conjugation while the, the minimizing of steric steric uh, type interactions. So I would like to look at urea, which is a, a slightly more complicated molecule than formamide. It's got two NH2 groups on the carbonyl. And this is a great example of needing to pay attention to the output uh, of a molecule and uh, uh, exactly what the vibrational frequencies are and thinking about what the cleanup tools are actually doing. So I'm going to flip back to WebMO for this one because I think it's worth uh, showing you the, the drawing and the cleanup here. So in order to make uh, urea, we just uh, make a, an atom with a double bond to another one, two single bonds, and then we convert these atoms to nitrogens. We convert this atom to an oxygen, and we can do some sort of cleanup. Now I want to remind you that we we don't want to spend time drawing H's. We want the cleanup tools to add those H's. So I'm going to try a comprehensive idealized first. And that gets me this uh, C2V uh, symmetry structure right here, where clearly all of the atoms are coplanar. So it's a nice flat structure. I would like to back up for a little bit go back to our uncleaned up structure. Instead of doing the, the idealized, I'd like to see what the, the mechanics thinks the cleanup ought to look like. 
So it cleaned it up to something that's nearly C2V. I can hit the symmetrize button there and lock that in. And so both cases, the, the cleanup tools agree that this ought to be a flat molecule. And that makes some good chemical sense. And I'd like to, to, to see if this is right. I mean, chemically, we've got nitrogen atom lone pairs that are adjacent to a carbonyl group. We know that lone pairs next to pi systems can, can conjugate. So it makes some good sense for this to be a, a planar molecule. And both of the cleanup tools come up with that structure for urea. So the only way to know if that's right is to optimize the structure and look at those vibrational frequencies and make sure that they're correct. So we'll, we'll set up the optimization the same way as before. I'm specifying the symmetry here on the urea molecule, because um, that's kind of important. And this is urea, and there's a chemical formula, so that's all right. We'll send that to the, the cube. So I already have that job completed as well. And here's the C2V optimized urea. Now, the molecule was planar to start with and has come out planar. Um, so that's not overly surprising. And I want to talk about one thing involving the optimization that I've sort of skipped until this point. Um, when you're building a molecule, it asks for a symmetry point group. When you finish an optimization, it, it reports the symmetry point group to the molecule. For the most part, we don't need that for Chem 344. Um, what I do want to draw your attention to is the fact that Gaussian itself is making use of the symmetry point group. It does so to speed up the calculation and make things move more efficiently, but by taking advantage of it, it locks the molecule into that, that symmetry. Another way of saying that is we made the molecule planar with the cleanup tools and submitted the molecule from Webbermone to Gaussian as a planar structure. Because we put the molecule in planar, and Gaussian takes advantage of that planarity to speed up the calculation, it guarantees the molecule come out planar. So looking at this structure on the screen right now, I don't know if it's planar because I started it planar, or if it's planar because it's supposed to be planar. The only way to know is to take a look at those vibrational frequencies. And what we see is that the first two are actually negative values. That tells me that urea is not supposed to be planar as a stable minimum. We have some you know, second order saddle point. We have a, a structure that's got a, an energy that's not the, the stable minimum. If we click on the animation for either one of these, it'll show us exactly what needs to change in the structure to make it the stable minimum. So we click on it. We can see that those NH groups are moving out of the plane. This is uh, the way that WebMO will communicate to you what's wrong with the molecule if you're trying to get a minimum and you've got a transition state. All we have to do is make the molecule non-planar in the way that these atoms are moving, and the program will optimize it uh, quite readily. The easiest way to do that, rather than redraw everything from scratch, is to just stop this video somewhere in its motion and use that structure. And so we can use the, the tools on the side over here to step forward or backward. Any of these geometries or those H's are out of the plane will work just fine. Um, I'll pick that one. And we'll run a new job from this geometry. Now it's going to give us a warning that we're using a, a non-optimized structure for a new calculation, which is true. But that's actually what we want to do in this case. We want to take this currently displayed geometry that is moving in the right direction and we want to run it as our new input structure. And now it says it has a C2 symmetry, um, which makes sense because it has a two-fold axis uh, of rotation, um, but it definitely does not have that planarity of a C2V. So you hit continue, uh, send it to the Chem 344 queue. I'm now going to change this to a different uh, job name there so we can keep it straight, and we'll uh, get that optimized structure. And what we'll see is that now, as a C2V structure, where those hydrogens are out of the plane, we now have all positive vibrational frequencies. So we, we optimize the structure the way the cleanup tools thought it should be. It turns out we got 
negative modes of vibration, which told us there's something wrong with the structure. We use the animation to see what's wrong with the structure. We make the correction. We resubmit it. And I really want to emphasize there wasn't a good way to know beforehand whether this molecule should be planar or not. If it has a lone pair, it's adjacent to a pi system, it makes sense that it could be planar. You have to actually run the job and check the vibrational uh, frequencies to know the answer. You really can't know it beforehand. And this is a great example as well of the fact that the cleanup tools don't actually know chemistry. The cleanup tools are just designed to give you a good guess. Unfortunately, both of the cleanup methods made the wrong guess. They both wanted it to be a C2B planar structure. It turns out it's not. You can't know that beforehand. You have to run the job and check the vibrational modes. Um, you can also click on the little magnifying glass icon and it'll put little arrows on the molecule telling you what's wrong with it uh, for the vibrational modes. Um, clearly, we can see that these, these atoms should be not planar, and the arrows are telling us to, to move those H's out of the plane up, move these H's out of the plane down. The other option we have is to grab one of the, the structures from the movie um, and submit that. But in any case, we can resubmit the job uh, where we've broken that uh, planar symmetry, um, and it'll get us to the correct C2 optimized minimum for urea. And I really want to draw your attention to this part in the bottom here. This is the big idea that you need to take forward in the other jobs you're going to run this semester. If you make a molecule planar, you can guarantee the molecule will come out planar. Um, Gaussian does not have the ability to break that symmetry. It makes the assumption that all of the atoms are in the plane and that's where they're going to stay. And as a result, greatly cuts down the computational time. The drawback of that is it can't break that symmetry. Um, another way of stating that is this sentence on the bottom. Uh, the molecule was planar as an output structure because we put it in planar. Uh, Gaussian can't change that. OK, so we know a lot more about the structure of urea now. Um, I'd like to look at those, those nitrogen atom lone pairs a little bit in better detail um, and sort of think about where they fit in the spectrum from an ammonia-type lone pair, which is really an sp3 orbital, to a formamid type lone pair, which is really sitting in, in a p orbital. And so I took that optimized structure for urea, and I ran an NBO calculation on it, and I uh, visualized both of the nitrogen atom lone pairs. Not surprisingly, they are perfectly symmetric. These are degenerate orbitals, meaning they're, they're the same energy and the, the same shape. Uh, we can see that from the NBO list that I have down here. The occupancies are identical on both of the nitrogen atom lone pairs. The energies are identical. These really are uh, symmetric or degenerate orbitals. They are clearly the same. So we have a, a bigger red lobe on top, smaller blue lobe on the bottom. Bigger red lobe on the bottom, smaller blue lobe on the top. The hybridization of these can be obtained from that same NBO uh, hybrid orbital list. It lists a 10% S character and a 89.17% P character. That works out to an SP8 hybridization. So that's not one of the standard ones you learn about, where it's SP, SP2, or SP3. It turns out that these hybridizations aren't really always nice, neat, whole numbers. And in this case, None of those descriptions fit this orbital. This is roughly an sp8 orbital. Another way of saying that is it's, it's like an sp3 orbital, but has more p character. It's p rich. An sp orbital uh, would be 50-50, s character, p character. An sp2 orbital would be one-third s, two-thirds p. An sp3 would be 25% s, 75% p. Well, this is just a little extra p-rich, which I think makes some sense when we think about what might be good about giving this lone pair some extra p-character. Both of these lone pairs are adjacent to the, the, the carbonyl group. And if those lone pairs have some extra p-character, they can more effectively overlap with the carbonyl group 
and form this pi system. Now it's a little bit weird looking pi system, a little bit different than the ones we saw in part one and part two. Um, this one has a little bit of a twist to it, and it's because the red lobe above the plane is different than the blue lobe below, because that nitrogen group is a little bit pyramidal, and we see that right here. And on the other side, we see that this red lobe is a little bit smaller on the top, blue lobe a little bit bigger uh, behind, and again, that's because of the asymmetry of that orbital. There are one, two, three, four atoms in conjugation, so there must be four pi molecular orbitals. And just like we saw in the earlier parts, pi 1 has total overlap, pi 2 has an increase of one node, so we go from zero nodes in pi 1 to one node in pi 2 to two nodes in pi 3 and three nodes in pi 4. And this fits with the pattern we've seen previously that when we get to the high energy uh, pi orbital, all of the atoms are, are separated and there are nodes in the pi system between each of those atoms. And so we see that this nitrogen lone pair is like one of the ones I described on the previous slide, in that it exists somewhere between the extremes of a, a p orbital lone pair of formamide or an sp3 hybridized lone pair of ammonia. And this is going to be true of many uh, nitrogen atoms uh, that are adjacent to pi systems. The other thing we can see is that these angles around the nitrogen atom, where they're the N, uh, HNH, or the HNC angles are all between 112 and 117 degrees. So this doesn't physically look in its molecular geometry like the perfect trigonal pyramidal shape of ammonia. And it doesn't look like a trigonal planar shape where all these angles are about 120 degrees. It's somewhere between the ideal 109 degrees and the ideal 120 degrees which sort of supports the idea that these two nitrogen atoms have hybridizations themselves that are somewhere between an sp2 hybrid and an sp3 hybrid. Uh, and again, we, we should expect this whenever we have nitrogen atoms that are uh, conjugated to a pi system. So sometimes we'll see sp2 hybridized nitrogens, sometimes we'll see sp3 hybridized nitrogens. When that conjugation exists, we're tending to have nitrogens that are somewhere in between. And when those nitrogens are hybridized somewhere between sp2 and sp3, we tend to see p-rich orbitals for those nitrogen atom lone pairs. And that's indeed the case um, that we see here for urea. Um, as a, a throwback to uh, part two a little bit, we also have the oxygen atom lone pairs from the carbonyl group listed here. And you can actually see that with these two lone pairs, just like the molecules we looked at already, one of those lone pairs is a p orbital. Um, this is typically not what people would expect uh, going with VSEPR and assuming a, a trigonal planar uh, electron geometry for that oxygen. Um, it turns out those are non-equivalent lone pairs on the oxygen, um, again, uh, contradictory to what VSCPR would predict, um, and so we can see that from the NDO output as well. Now, in this case, we talked about how these nitrogen atoms are pyramidal, they're not planar. We saw a negative vibrational modes for the planar structure. The energy difference between the planar structure and the pyramidal one is very small in this case, uh, but there is a real difference, and this is the, the true minimum. So I'd like to use the information we just figured out to think about the, the chemical reactivity um, that results as, as an effect of this conjugated pi system and these different lone pairs on the different atoms. And a simple thing for us to look at is the acid-base chemistry of urea. Uh, urea is a base. If you know a lot about pKa's, you actually know the answer to this question already. Uh, but we're going to use some computational chemistry to figure out whether a reaction between an acid and urea occurs with the H plus attaching itself to the oxygen atom or the H plus attaching itself to the, the nitrogen atom. This requires we create uh, an ion, 
uh, cannot in particular in WebML, and I'll show how to do that in just a second. Uh, but we also need to understand something about uh, potential energy surfaces and reactivity. Uh, the first thing is what it means to have an acid base reaction. This is a, a weak base, uh, and it can react with an H plus and go over some energy barrier to get to the two possible products. This could be a big energy separation, it could be a small energy separation. There's no way to know that ahead of time. But what we do need to know is that this is a thermodynamic equilibrium. So all that matters in our, our reasoning about which is most likely to form is the energy difference between the product and the reactants it came from. And in this convenient case, both of these possible products have the exact same two reactants. So all we really need to do is just know the energy difference between these two, and it will tell us which one is more likely to form, whether both will form, or only one will be the dominant. So we'll be able to look at that. Before we do that, I need to add one number to everybody's thinking. In general, uh, an energy gap of 1.4 kcals per mole translates roughly into a factor of 10 difference in the abundance. So if we get an energy difference of less than 1.4, we should expect a lot of the H attaching at both places. If we get an answer of 2.8, we'd expect uh, two factors of 10, so 1 to 100, um, and, and so on. And so we can use this 1.4 to give us a rough estimate of uh, the abundance of both of these species after protonation. So let's, let's protonate urea. We can actually make this from scratch and redraw it uh, from the beginning, or we can just take our optimized urea structure um, and add a formal charge to one of the atoms. Now we know formal charges are real charges. But they're really useful for bookkeeping and communication. And WebMO takes advantage of the same convenience and allows you to actually set a charge on an atom. In this case, the oxygen. I've right-clicked on it. I'm setting the charge to, uh, right now it's zero. We'll make it one. So I'm setting that charge to one. We hit OK. And it displays a little plus one on the oxygen atom. Now when we use the cleanup tools, it will take into account that we've set the formal charge on the oxygen. It will recognize that that oxygen should have an extra hydrogen on it. And when it cleans up, it will put it there. So when I do the cleanup mechanics, I get this C1 structure with a, a, a plus one on the uh, atom there. If I do the idealized, I get this uh, CS structure um, again. There's no way to know which one is right until we do the optimization. Um, it turns out the molecule is going to be very nearly CS. And the only reason I know that is I've done this calculation before. You can't know ahead of time which of those two cleanup tools is right. So there are going to be times this semester where you're going to be uncertain. You're going to have to try the optimization, look at the output, and assess whether it was correct or not. So I'll, I'll say, hey, let's assume it's CS and submit this job. So we'll send it to the 344Q. Um, it now has a plus one in the chemical formula. I'm going to mention that there's an OH group on this, and that it's a CS symmetry. Um, it also has changed so that the charge is now set to one. If you want a positive ion, you absolutely have to confirm that the charge is set to plus one, um, and it is. So we can now submit that. And we could do the exact same thing for the uh, nitrogen atom and get an extra uh, H attached to the nitrogen atom. Um, but uh, we'll flip back to the PowerPoint since I've already sort of done that for us. Here are the two optimized structures. Um, one with a, an H on the nitrogen and one with an H plus on the, the oxygen. Um, I checked that both of these structures had all positive vibrational frequencies, so they're both minimum. Um, this one actually has a CS uh, symmetry where everything is perfectly planar, except one NH is above the plane, and one NH right there is below the plane. This molecule over here on the right 
has this H just ever so slightly tweaked up out of the plane. Um, and these are the optimized structures of these two molecules. And I encourage you, if you'd like to investigate them further, to make them yourself. Um, here are the energies that I pulled out of the output file. They don't mean a whole lot to me in heart trees. Um, they're almost the exact same energy with a little bit of difference in the second decimal place. Um, these are the absolute energies in heart trees that come out of the calculation. They're always going to be big. They're always going to be negative. They're much more useful if we convert them to kcals. Um, now they're even bigger giant negative numbers with small changes here. Now uh, on the left side of the decimal place. Again, we're always going to convert those to relative energies so that we can think about them more reasonably. And so the relative energy difference here is 12.7 kcals per mole. This is a really big energy difference. 1.4 kcals per mole is enough to have a difference in a factor of 10 in their abundance. This is like eight factors of 1.4. It's just like eight factors of 10 difference in their abundance. This is a huge difference uh, in their, their stabilities. And so this, this tells us that only the oxygen is going to be protonated to any substantial amount. This nitrogen protonation, not really going to happen. And so we can think about why that might be the case. We can explain this reactivity by thinking about the structures and by thinking about the orbitals. So yeah, again, this is a, a huge, huge energy difference, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. 12 kcals per mole, big difference in their stability. The answer, I think, is hidden in these two images of the pi one of both uh, species. The, the one on the left shows that by putting an H plus on this nitrogen, we have removed that nitrogen from the conjugation that we see in urea. We now only have three atoms in conjugation. So we've removed conjugation, which is always a destabilizing thing. Here, we actually have all of our four atoms, the nitrogen, the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, all still in conjugation because the, the lone pair we attached the hydrogen to wasn't part of the pi system up here. And since that oxygen lone pair wasn't part of the pi system, putting an H plus on it doesn't break that conjugated pi system. And so by removing an atom from conjugation here, we have a much higher energy cost than we do putting the H plus on the oxygen in the case on the right. So that helps explain this big difference. One of the cool features that you can actually see here as well is by protonating this nitrogen, that one got really flat. By protonating this oxygen, both of these nitrogens got really flat. It tells us it increased the amount to which those nitrogens were in conjugation with the carbonyl group, which I think makes some really good sense. Um, we now have a species that has a, a deficient end in terms of its electron density, the oxygen has an H plus attached to it. The hydrogen didn't come in with any electrons of its own. So we've now made an electron deficient oxygen to the extent that we can increase the conjugation from the nitrogens, we can delocalize that charge throughout the molecule. And that's exactly what the protonated urea molecule does. And the same thing with the structure on the left over here. Um, by attaching an extra hydrogen here, We've made a really good electron withdrawing group, an NH3 plus group, which makes this carbon atom more electron deficient as a result. The molecule flattens out to encourage this lone pair to be better conjugated uh, with the carbonyl group uh, and, and stabilize a more planar structure in both of those cases. So greater planarity allows for greater conjugation and helps the, the molecule stabilize that positive charge. And here's what we understand about the reactivity. Both of these molecules come from the same two reagents. And so I want to stress that this is a thermodynamic reaction. We don't care about the barrier. The barrier is irrelevant. Acid base is a thermodynamic equilibrium. So we only care about the energies of the products. They have the same reagents, so we really only care about the difference between the two. And it's 12.7 kcals per mole in energy higher to protonate that nitrogen and the oxygen 
1.4 kcals per mole is roughly a factor of 10. So this N protonation is not something we need to consider for the molecule we urea when protonated. So the final thing I want to talk about as we wrap up our, our pre-lab lectures um, has to do with how to turn in data this semester in Chem 344. As you're working through Chapter 5, you're going to run a lot of calculations. Um, we're not going to ask you to provide job numbers of all of the calculations for Chapter 5 because it's purely uh, a computational experiment. And it really is designed to get you familiar with these tools and get you familiar with how to think about and talk about and write about uh, molecular modeling in the context of chemical reactivity and chemical structure. Beyond chapter five, so all of the subsequent experiments uh, this semester, um, when you have to turn in some computational data, we want you to tell us the job number in WebMO, which is uh, sitting right there in front of the name. We want to know that for every optimization and vibrational frequency calculation. We want to know that for the NBO calculation. That will allow your, your instructors, your TA, uh, myself, uh, to look at your job and understand uh, uh, any issues that you might have had. We'll be able to find it in your account. Um, we also want you to provide some sort of 3D image um, so that we understand your structure um, and can make sense of the, the arguments you're making based on your, your optimized structure. So if you're, you're writing an answer that involves talking about an orbital, show us that orbital. If you're writing an answer that involves talking about some sort of structure, make sure you show a, a, a picture of that 3D structure. Occasionally, people will turn in images printed one per page in like 20 pages of uh, giant molecules. Please feel free to put multiple ones per page so you can print them uh, much more cheaply and easily. Um, and then the final bit um, is that any data you turn in computationally absolutely has to be your own. And I really want to stress that. Um, when you turn in data, you are telling us that you calculated it. Um, it has to be your own work. Um, and it has to have come from your account. Um, we've had some issues of academic misconduct involving this. Um, so, so please be aware of our restriction that you provide us the job number for all of your data, that you provide us images, and that these really are your own images and not uh, somebody else's.